Baltimore County for September 12, 2017. I invite you to rise and recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag to be led by Rob Maloney. We will then remain standing for a moment of silence and recognition of those who have served the nation of Baltimore County. And I ask if you will also to remember this day after 9-11, those who died and those who uh, um, died serving us. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Are there any additions or changes to tonight's agenda? Mr. Chair, there are no changes or additions. All in favor of the, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the agenda as prepared um, uh, will uh, proceed. Uh, next on our agenda is the selection of speakers. Uh, Sign-up cards were available to the public prior to the meeting for anyone wishing to speak at this evening's meeting. Board practice limits to 10, the number of speakers at a regularly scheduled board meeting. Each speaker is allowed three minutes to address the board. The completed sign-up cards for this evening have been placed in the box to my right, and the first 10 drawn from the box will be our speakers. And I ask Ms. Schaefer to pick and Mr. Virch to read. Sharon Soroff. Dr. Farone. Diana Bergman. Melissa McClellan. Gretchen Manival. Yara Cheek. Ricardo Ramsey. Margaret Gibson. That's it. <laughs> Very official, thank you. Our next item is public comment. This is one of the opportunities the board provides to hear the views and receive advice of community members. The members of the board appreciate hearing from interested citizens. Uh, while we encourage public input on policy programs and practices within the purview of the board uh, and the system, this isn't the proper forum to address specific student or employee matters or to comment on matters that do not relate to public education in Baltimore County. I ask all of you to observe the three-minute clock. Uh, we're pleased to have uh, two elected officials here this evening, and um, I would like to invite both of them to come up and uh, share a minute or two with us. Uh, first, uh, Senator Jim Brochin, and then uh, Delegate Chris West. Senator. Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Nice tie. Before I begin, I want to compliment your selection of your <laughs> shirt, tie, and suit. <laughs> um, you did very well today. Um, so I'm here to ask you, uh, all of you, first of all, it's a pleasure to see all of you together, and uh, I, I compliment uh, the makeup of the board. I think it's a very balanced board, and uh, it's good to see the board together. Um, I'm here to ask that uh, you add planning and design money uh, for what I think are the two most challenged uh, facilities, uh, high schools in Baltimore County, uh, and that's Towson and Delaney. Uh, I know there is uh, some movements uh, uh, that uh, some people want to add one school and not the other, uh, and I give you the perspective from the state senator for the from the 42nd district. So my district starts uh, at the Baltimore City, Baltimore County line, which includes Towson High, and goes all the way to the Pennsylvania line, uh, which includes Delaney. Uh, and I can tell you that uh, picking and choosing which school has the most challenges uh, 
is impossible. Uh, I think the schools are analogous. They each have their problems. Uh, and I think that when you're adding planning and design money, the one thing I don't want to do, and I think would be very detrimental to, to my di district, the 42nd district, is to pit one school against another, to pit one set of parents against another set of parents. Uh, and I think they should rise together. Uh, I think it's possible, and as I've spoken before, uh, the next county executive uh, is gonna have some challenges, but one of the challenges uh, they're not gonna have is it's a county that's uh, well-funded and has realized a surplus every year of between 240 and $340 million a year. Uh, so if you use surplus money for one-time expenses, which I think is a good move, uh, we can move forward uh, on these schools, and I think they should both rise together. And I don't want to pit community against community. I think it would be very harmful and very detrimental, uh, and I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Delegate West. Yes, uh, thank you very much for inviting me to speak this evening. It's a pleasure to be before you. Uh, I really enjoyed uh, a couple of days ago touring a couple of the schools in the Northern County with uh, Verlita White. Verlita White. Uh, it was an eye-opening experience and very interesting for me. So thank you so much for inviting me. I want to also discuss the Towson and Delaney High Schools. The Baltimore County Public Schools priority list criteria emphasize one, air conditioning, two, size, and three, infrastructure in that order. If air conditioning is truly the county's top priority, then why was Delaney High School, which was included on last year's list and the year before's list, omitted from this list because if this list stands and the projects on the list are completed, Delaney will be the only high school in the county with no air conditioning. Further, Delaney has serious structural problems. The brown water coming out of its faucets is legendary and it's expected to become seriously overcrowded within the next several years. Turning to Towson High School, that facility is over 70 years old and as all of you know, uh, high schools are not used gently. Uh, they receive lots of rough use. This, is, this facility has received 70 years of rough use and it's seriously overcrowded right now. There are multiple modular classroom units in the back of the school because the school can't accommodate all the students. Yet Towson has never appeared on the list of priority projects. The draft 2017 list contains 34 proposed projects. Only a single project, and that one 34th on the list, um, the least important priority of all is located in the central part of Baltimore County. Uh, this is unacceptable. I intend to make my top priority for the next five years the construction of a new Towson High School and a new Delaney High School. The 2017 draft list should not be adopted in its current form. The families in Towson and Delaney deserve facilities as excellent as their teachers and their students. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Delegate. Uh, we'll now go to the advisory and stakeholder group uh, speakers. Uh, the first speaker is from TABCO, and that's Glenn Galante. Good evening, Chairman Gills, Ms. White, and members of the board. Uh, Mrs. Baton was held up in Annapolis today. She was testifying at a Senate hearing uh, regarding community schools. So I do have a statement she'd like me to read to you. The weather has been kind to us so far this school year. She doesn't want to jinx anything, but the heat stay, has stayed away for the most part. Except for some rain, we have stayed clear of some of the terrible weather other parts of the country have been experiencing. The school year for students began with visits from the governor and a state superintendent. Many of you joined Ms. White in our visits to several schools over the first week as Mrs. Baton did. We all felt incredibly impressed and thankful for the wonderful staff we watch working with our students. The children were engaged, actively learning, and having fun while doing so. The amount of work our teachers put into their profession was evident. This school year, we have only 13 school buildings without air conditioning, and some of those schools will begin completely rebuilt buildings. However, there are some other schools that are still without air conditioning. They may have partial air conditioning or chillers that need to be replaced or other issues hampering the comfort level in those buildings. These students should not be forgotten and should be addressed as soon as possible. With the capital budget up for discussion tonight, these schools need to be part of the consideration. If not for the capital budget this year, then next year. We should not keep kicking the proverbial can down the road. On another note, we need to start advocating with our legislators at the state and county level to fully fund education. 
She's testifying right now at a state Senate judicial hearing in Annapolis about the need for community schools to help with violence and disruptive youth. Our community schools effort will help us with those issues by increasing our parental and community involvement in the schools. It has been proven that these schools help stabilize communities and help bring attendance and graduate, graduation rates up, as well as provide other school activities so our children are not roaming the streets unattended in the, in the afternoon or evenings. The voice of this board sends a strong message to the legislators about the needs of our school. Thank you, Abby Bain. Thank you, Mr. Galante. Our next speaker is a representative from the PTA Council of Baltimore County, and that's Jane Lee. Good evening, uh, Good evening. Chairman Gillis, Ms. White, board members. PTA Council met last Thursday. We set goals for the year. Uh, we approved quite a few plans of work, and we finished in less than an hour and a half, Mr. Young. Um, we are moving forward, <laughs> and we are working hard. We are listening to our membership, and in light of that, we are participating in an online survey, the first of a few. This one will be asking parents how they feel about the stat, and this is not the CPS-sponsored one, it is from us, so that we have feedback and know how to advocate. This is only our first survey. I plan on doing more. Um, Part of the job that I, that I took on also meant that I spent my weekend in national PTA training, and I will be bringing that back to membership. On September 28th, we will be having a workshop and reception for our members. It is open. I invite everyone to please come. The dinner does cost $10, but the training does not. Um, calls this week. I'm not surprised that the major calls I've gotten were transportation. That's usual at the beginning of the year. I am a little upset at what types of calls. It wasn't just my kid was late to school. It was my child was dropped off at the wrong school. My kid was never picked up. My child was sitting forward to a seat on a bus. There seems to be a lack of communication with bus schedules. There's no phone, nobody answering the phones at the transportation office when parents are trying to call. That upsets me. Um, parents don't know where their children are. Uh, next, the budget. We don't consider schools fully funded until such time as every school has been established that children are in a safe learning environment. That includes air conditioning, that includes water that's clean and safe, and that, and that includes structures that are safe and conducive to good learning. We aren't there. We are concerned about schools that are not on the list and those that have dropped off the list to get what they need, and we hope that you will start working toward that, and we also plan on talking to our legislators so you have the money to do that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is a representative from the Citizens Advisory Committee for Gifted and Talented Education. That's Julie miller Bretz. Good evening, Chairman Gillis, board members, Ms. White, and the BCPS community. The GTCAC is a group that supports gifted and talented education in Baltimore County Public Schools. One of the ways we do this is by communicating and collaborating with the BCPS superintendent, staff, and the BCPS Board of Education about the needs of GT students. In that spirit of communication and collaboration, the GTCAC holds an annual meeting where we invite the superintendent to come speak to our group and to listen to our group. We are thrilled that Ms. White has agreed to continue this tradition and we look forward to our meeting with her on December 6th. However, when we have our meeting with Ms. White, we will likely still be discussing many of the same issues we brought up with Dr. Dance last December. Our group, through our website, Facebook page, mass email campaigns, and especially our face-to-face -face listening post meetings at schools around the county, led us to devise advisory stances that we delivered to Dr. Dance last year. These stances were meant to assist BCPS in identifying where problems exist and thoughts about how some of these issues could begin to be resolved. Some of our thoughts about solutions are easily accomplished, while others will require more time, attention, and money. 
There is, however, one action item that would go a long way in resolving a great number of the issues we have identified with GT in Baltimore County, hiring more staff for the Advanced Academic Office. This should be the beginning from which other changes stem. Did you know that approximately 10 to 12 years ago, the Advanced Academic Office had an 11-person office as opposed to the six-person office it, is, it has now? Today's office has a coordinator, a secretary, and four amazing resource teachers, two for the secondary level and two for the elementary level. A decade ago, though, there were nine resource teachers, a resource teacher for each content area at the secondary level, ELA, math, science, and social studies, three resource teachers at the elementary level, ELA, math, and a combined social studies and science resource person, as well as two people who served as resources for the primary talent development or PTD program. And there was one catalyst teacher in each Title I elementary school that allowed those schools to offer daily assistance in identifying and nurturing student talents and gifts. What does this mean? It meant that professional development could be provided monthly to the catalyst teachers to help solve issues and provide clarifications. Data could be collected and needs were immediately identified. This additional personnel also afforded the office the opportunity, opportunity to get to non-Title I schools as well. The PTD resource teachers allowed for the development and promotion of that important program. All schools benefited from it since it embedded PD and again encouraged and nurtured gifts and talents in very young learners and provided opportunities for data collection. What could it mean? Having more subject-specific personnel would allow the AA office to write curricula and revise curricula across all content area. It would provide increased opportunities for professional development as required by COMAR. PTD could be revised and implemented. After-school programs for school-wide enrichment and summer bridge programs for advanced learners could be developed. It's time to begin restoring this. Great timing. Our next speaker is uh, from the Area Education Advisory Council Central Area, and that's Daya Cheney Webb. Thank you, committee members of the board. How are you tonight? Very good. It's good to see your faces, and you know I don't do this very often, so I'm nervous. Um, so first I want to announce that the Central Area has scheduled its pre-budget hearing. Um, this will be October 18th from 7 to 9 p.m. at Dumbarton Middle School. For those who don't know about your area advisories, check out our page on bcps.org. We hold several meetings throughout the year with topics centered around hot issues and representatives from BCPS to provide information and take questions and concerns. The pre-budget meeting is designated to take testimony and public comment on budget items that should be addressed, where we're spending money currently and where we should be spending money currently. Next, I'd like to talk about transportation. You all received my email today with a spreadsheet of 60 responses in one week to a complaint form that I posted on a Facebook page last Monday, right? So. That list illustrates major issues with delivery of transportation services on this first week of school. And I do recognize the need for a little more time to iron out the glitches, but in the light of how long we've waited for problems in transportation to be fixed, it's hard to accept. The central, in the central area, I spoke with three groups of parents um, on back to school night at Dumbarton Middle who can't understand why their children don't receive bus service and have a 40 minute walk instead. A mile and a half as the crow flies is sometimes a really long walk. Um, the 60 complaints I sent to you acts as a small sample of a more global issue, one that warrants more concern from the school system than it's received so far. These problems have progressively gotten worse year after year within the last three years that I've served on an advisory council to this board. Our kids and families deserve better transportation service than what BCPS has provided. I've been, long, I've been around long enough to know that you know. We've talked about this countless times at work group meetings, at superintendents meetings, at advisory meetings, et cetera. Still, we've got overcrowding on the buses. This is a major problem. This is really dangerous. I've seen videos of kids sitting on the floor of the aisle because they're crammed in these buses. Um, 
advocates are, it's this kind of response to parent concern that we need from you. Advocates and school groups have a hard time gathering parents to join in and speak up because they think that their efforts won't matter. And to be honest, I wonder sometimes too. <laughs> Thank you very much. Very good. Our next speaker is from the Northeast Area Advisory Council, and that's Thor Trigveson. Good evening, board members. Good evening. Um, I'm here tonight to talk to you about overcrowding and transportation issues in the Northeast area. I'd like to start out by pointing out that there is no report form or ticketing system on the BCPS website for transportation issues. So the Northeast Advisory took it up on its own to gather data from parents this fall, and we have um, shared the results with the BCPS transportation staff. We have asked that the BCPS transportation get in touch with each and every parent that has sent us a report on an issue with transportation, and we have been assured that they will do that. What we have seen reported is horrifying and shouldn't be a reality in 2017. We have parents reporting that their elementary school aged children are left at the last bus stop because they took the wrong bus and the driver will not return the kid to school. Whose responsibility is that? We have reports of child being dropped off on an unknown bus stop. The kid calls his parents not knowing where she is. Parents are unable to reach BCPS transportation or the school as no one answered. Finally, the police was called in to locate the child. This cannot be acceptable by the board. The Northeast Advisory strongly agrees with board member Julie Han that a public hearing on transportation issues is needed. Please consider putting that on the BCPS schedule. We would also like to bring to your attention the long bus rides the special education children have to endure. While they do get a sightseeing tour of our beautiful county, perhaps there's a possibility to cut down on travel time with better plans and additional transportation vehicle. Finally, we would like to bring to your attention the overcrowding on buses. For example, at Perry Hall Middle, we have 41 bus rides that daily exceed the maximum amount of students on the bus. 41 out of 79 rides, that's 52% that are overcrowded. BCPS transportation is endangering the lives of children to save a buck by putting more kids on the buses than manufacturers deem safe. The safety systems do not work when there are three kids to a seat or there are kids in the middle aisle of the bus. Bus manufacturers say that no more than two children are to be seated in a seat for middle school age and up. I wouldn't want to be in your seat when there's an accident with an overcrowded bus, and I'm sure you don't either. Please act now. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next is time for public comment speakers, and the first speaker is Sharon Saroff. Good evening, members of the board. I've got a list. It starts with transportation, which you've already heard about. And I'm going to focus on special ed transportation, because it's not acceptable for our kids to miss instruction for a day or for an hour. It is not acceptable for our children to be left on the side of the road. Some of our kids are nonverbal. If they don't know where they are and they have no way to communicate, how are we going to find them? We need to do better. This is a problem that has been going on for years. We need to fix it yesterday. My phone was ringing off the hook on the first day of school as an advocate because of transportation problems, because of my clients not getting schedules for the first day of school. Think about it, if you don't know where you're going and you're a neurotypical kid and you don't have your schedule, what about our kids? That's not okay. Again, they miss instruction, it impacts the routine, it impacts their anxiety level. We can't afford this. Special Ed accountability. 
That doesn't come from the top. That comes from each individual school. It is not okay when I have to advocate for one of my clients to receive an entire year of compensatory services because a school didn't think they deserved to have their IEP followed. That needs to be addressed. Twice exceptional children. You've heard me talk about that before. I'm the mother of two of them who graduated from the school system. It should not have to be that I am hearing from a client, much less as a parent, that my child with a special need is too smart to deserve an IEP to help him with his services. That he is too smart to even receive or need services. That's not what the law says. <coughs> and lastly, I know that you hear constantly about Delaney and about Towson High School. What about Lansdowne? Lansdowne needs a new building because Lansdowne is literally sinking into the ground. And they have exemplary magnet programs that is Baltimore County's best kept secret. We can do better, and we should. Thank you. Our next speaker is Bosch Ferron. Good evening to all. Doctor. Um, I'm concerned about the budget. It's one page, to my surprise, or close to it. It's really vague. Not clear how the priority order has been made. Building score, I really don't understand it. There is no explanation for it. And Lansdowne, people came down from Lansdowne, large numbers, didn't matter, they lost. Of course, Towson and Delaney, you heard about them today. It's really not clear why those people lost for other preferable schools. There are priority gaps that don't make sense. And in brief, really, when I read that budget, I really don't understand as a taxpayer, how did you select it? How did you make some get this AC or this new building and others don't? One thought for you is that the Pentagon is able to build hospitals in a very short period of time, disassemble them in a very short period of time, move them around. Maybe we can't really afford nice buildings of nice bro you know, bricks and so forth. Maybe there is a way to cut down on architecture, on building and so forth. And I think Ms. Cozy the other day, last year, talked about air conditioners. Why other counties, for instance, can buy small windows air conditioners at a small price, where I am sitting and listening to the cost of air conditioner additions to be very expensive. I don't see that in the budget. I don't see that the board has really spent effort in um, addressing these issues or conveying to us like taxpayers. Last, I want to talk to you about September 21st. The school is closing for Rosh Hashanah. For 13 years, there is no objective, verifiable reason why the schools are closing on a religious holiday. It's a giveaway. It counts like money. The school loses each time there is a closure for whatever reason. So I ask you today to show me and other citizens, how did you come up with that? Where are the data that are verifiable and objective to justify closing on clearly religious holidays? It is unfair. It's form of discrimination. It's form of religious apartheid where people have and other people don't have. And that's really unfair for taxpayers. It almost reminds me really with the hospital believing in God and they behave Thank you, Doctor. Our next speaker is Diana Bergman.
Good evening. Buenas tardes. Hi, everybody. How you doing? So I'm going to talk about a couple things that are on my top priority list. First one is transportation. Um, we've been gathering information from different parents, and we really need our voice to be heard. We want the opportunity for public hearing to be able to communicate with you regarding your transportation issues. Um, that way it will give me an opportunity to give a few suggestions. For example, why is it that something like materials were able to track on how it transport from one location to location, like UPS or our U.S. Postal Service? It's assigned a number, and we know that package is handled with care, and we can find out where it's going. Well, our children are the most important, precious little bits of life that um, we need to handle with care. We need to see how they're going. Um, I know in the past it was talked about using BCP as one, and there were some privacy concerns, but why not assign a PIN number? A PIN number to have a productive communication system for an alert system. So that way we know child's arrival, departure, make sure that they're going in the right location. I mean, we have the technology to do it. Um, what's holding us back from moving forward? And it saves time. When my principal has to communicate with transportation and nobody picks up because they have nobody at the lot, guess what? That wastes 20, 15 minutes here and there. I want my principal doing something in the school site <laughs> before um, I have to wait around to hear a response. Um, as the year goes forward, I know one of the big topics is climate. <coughs> And that's very important. Our children should feel as they're riding to school and from school that they feel safe throughout the school year. After the madness of the beginning of the school year, we're going to have issues with children um, with behavior problems. And we need a solid communication system to make sure our principals are handling the discipline part that's going on on the, on the transportation route. And last but not least is my community of Lansdowne. Um, we shouldn't pin community against community. But please do not forget Lansdowne. Our building is literally sinking into the lake. Lansdowne Elementary is going to get a new building, but until that happens, we need to come up with a little solution to cool this area down because we have children that are learning in environments like what's going on in Florida. There's no electricity. There's no AC. There's no school until they get that AC running. Why are we putting our kids in buildings? There's, a, I believe, about 13 of them that still have um, no AC. And those children deserve better, regardless what community they're in. So I'm asking for. Here. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Melissa McClellan. Good evening. Good evening. I'm here to speak of a recent incident involving my child that attends Parkville Elementary, I mean Parkville Middle School, sorry, Samuel McClellan. My child's bus was late on the second day of school. He ended up boarding an incorrect bus due to it being 35 minutes late. He asked the driver several times if she was going to a stop, which is located in Essex, Maryland. Eventually she answered down the street, no. And then she pulled off, was she, then she, you know, she, she pulled over eventually and told him to get off the bus. My, my child was stranded. If, and he tried getting her to return him to the school, but she refused. Essentially, he didn't know where he was. He's in a magnet school and he, he had ended up calling me. If he didn't have a phone, if it was one of our special needs children or maybe a younger child, how would they contact their parent? And when my child was in Orms last year, um, essentially I saved a child, a pre-K child was stopped, dropped off at a bus and there was no parent or parents there. He was at the wrong stop. So this is not a first time this has happened. Um, I couldn't get through to Barmer County Transportation two different numbers, and I couldn't get a hold of Parkville. There needs to be some kind of in-call system set up or something for emergencies. I end up calling the police, 
and my friend actually was trying to find my son too at the same time and she couldn't find him. The police officer found my child and took him to my girlfriend's house until I can get out to Parkville because I live in Essex and I have a special needs child coming home about 3.50, so I can't be in two places at once. Um, I feel like there was no real concern about the ordeal that my son went, went through. There was no accountability. And it was like, there needs to be something in place or some kind of protocol for when things like this happen to protect our children, our students. And I'm also requesting that a public hearing be in place for the school system to get a true estimate of the problems happening in transportation. Because I'm a parent that's entirely involved online with groups and I'm seeing it all across the board, especially here at the beginning of the school. There's so many children that are missing their buses. They're being, you know, they're not, the buses aren't showing up. Matter of fact, one day my son's bus didn't show up on the first morning of the school. And I had called the school. I took my child to school because he called me after my daughter had left. And I called transportation, got through, and they sent a bus out. And this is ridiculous. And there was another family. The bus didn't show up for 90 minutes late at Parkville Middle School. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Gretchen Man Manival. Good evening, everyone. My name is Gretchen Manival. I'm here representing THS New and 22. Um, first of all, thanks so much for the opportunity to speak with you this evening. Um, thank you for your service to our schools. Um, we've spent the last several months since I last testified at the May 24th budget hearing having the opportunity to speak with many of you and hearing your perspective and understanding the difficult decisions um, that have to be made around these choices for school facilities funding. Um, we understand and applaud the need for equitable decision making. Um, we are absolutely grateful um, for the other parent advocates and the guidance and support they've given to us as we navigate through these issues. Um, what this comes down to is that these don't need to be subjective decisions, right? Um, we have measurable and objective benchmarks that we've looked at in terms of overcapacity, in terms of school building conditions. Um, they have been purposeful and rigorous in their analysis. And in terms of Towson High School and looking at their issues of overcrowding, um, as you all well know, in the next several years, we're gonna be facing 140% overcapacity. Um, we currently have severe fire code violations that need to be addressed. And the Baltimore County Public Schools own facilities report ranked Towson as the third worst building. So uh, after having had conversations with many of you and the various electeds and the superintendent and the county executive, um, we know that we're all on the same page of the, about this and we know that there is, and we trust in the fact that there's goodwill about this decision making. So moving forward, please do let us know how we can be helpful uh, and if you need any information from us um, or the community to move forward. Um, you know, our schools are not only places of learning for our children, um, but as we all know, they're economic drivers for our community and for Baltimore County. And um, these exemplary um, academic achievements of our students um, and of our teachers and our staff um, need to be honored by facilities that are commensurate um, with that standard of nationally ranked excellence. So thank you so much for your time and your consideration. And again, please let us know how we can be helpful. Have a good night. Thank you. Our next speaker is Yara Sheik. Good evening, Chairman Gillis and Superintendent White and Board of Education. In the past, I've applauded the board's decision to base construction priorities on the BCPS facilities report as schools that are chosen for renovation or replacement. I want to again thank you for not voting on the $36 million limited renovation to DHS at a cost of $144 a square foot less than half of what was spent at smaller schools with half the population of DHS. It was a good decision. 
but I would ask why the budget does not include a replacement school for Delaney High School. I think at the cost, at the 2018 state funding formula cost of $285 a square foot, that puts a renovation for Delaney High School at over $71 million, which I think we can all agree is too much to renovate when the cost of a new school is between 110 and $130 million with increased state funding. So today I'm asking for planning and design money for the worst mechanical and electrical plumbing high school that doesn't have a solution in front of it. And I'm asking you to also look at Towson High School as we move forward. Waiting for the high school study on seats for these two high schools, as the study will reveal the projections that have already been made public in the BCPS enrollment numbers. And replacing these schools now allows for the opportunity to build two larger schools, similar to the schools that were built um, like Severna Park High School, which went from a population enrollment of 1,800 to 2,100 after planning and design. We're asking you to make the decisions about when schools are built. We're asking you to prioritize schools using the facilities report that you have. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ricardo Ramsey. Uh, good evening, uh, Chair McGillis, Superintendent White, and board members. Uh, my name is Ricardo Ramsey, and I'm a mad Woodlawn High School parent. What I mean by mad, make a difference. It's nothing negative. I thank the board for a lot of good, great things that are going on at Woodlawn, but a lot of problems are still happening at Woodlawn High School. And I'm just here to let you guys know that Woodlawn High School does have a voice. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Ramsey. Our next speaker is Margaret Gibson. Hello, board members and Madam Superintendent. I am Margaret Gibson, the mother to five dyslexic children and to many dyslexic nieces and nephews. All of my children have been through Baltimore County Public Schools, which has provided me a cumulative 32 years worth of experience working with and against the school system. Last year alone, I attended 24 IEP meetings and filed for mediation twice. My family story, as well as others, was just featured in the American Public Media's podcast, Hard to Read, How American Schools Fail Kids with Dyslexia. We are just a few of the many families who approach Decoding Dyslexia Weekly for support and information. I want the board to know that the issue of dyslexia is still a large one within BCPS. I know that our school system can and should do better. Thank you for taking the first step and beginning to train some teachers in Orton-Gillingham. Early screening is essential for remediation. We need to identify students in kindergarten. Research shows that early intervention can prevent reading failure, anxiety, and other comorbidities of failing in school. Programs like iReady are not designed to identify or remediate a child with significant reading deficits. The two key indicators of persistent reading difficulties are significant difficulty with phonemic awareness and rapid automatized naming. BCPS's inappropriate implementation of iReady is causing harm to its students by not identifying the root cause of the reading deficit. Once a student is identified as needing support, they are already years behind. BCPS must collect baseline data on the student and continue with appropriate progress monitoring. I have been told by BCPS administration countless times that my child no longer needed intervention because they were making progress. Without baseline data, these claims cannot be proven true or false. You just don't know where the student is going. This is why the school system must continue to train their teachers about struggling readers and the expected response to intervention. We know that all children benefit from multi-sensory structured literacy. The time is now to train all of our teachers in structured literacy and not use iReady as a substitute. 
I am asking the board to implement early screening and early intervention for all struggling readers, as is their right under federal law. Thank you. Thank you. Next on our agenda is um, the superintendent's report. Ms. White. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. I would like to start by thanking our board members for joining me and welcoming students and staff back to the new school year during the past week. From the very first day, our teachers have been engaging students in learning and establishing those routines that support strong relationships and high quality instruction. I cannot say enough how thankful I am to our leaders and to our staff for all of their hard work to prepare for this school year and to Governor Larry Hogan and to State Superintendent Karen Salmon, as well as County Executive Kevin Kamenetz for their welcoming presence on our very first day of school. In reflecting on the past two months, I am so grateful for the many opportunities this summer to meet with students and staff in schools to visit various offices and to hear from the residents throughout our community. These conversations help keep me rooted to what truly matters, and that has to be the success of every student. So in terms of back to school, I would like to also thank our community members for their generosity during this year's Back to School Involves You Too campaign. We were able to supply more than 600 teachers with, uh, with school supplies to support students in need, thanks to donations from more than 67 businesses and organizations in partnership with the Education Foundation. The campaign also included our Back to School Festival at Boscovs in White Marsh, which drew about 1,000 attendees and BCPS Day as well at Camden Yards. In terms of our um, passport program, I'd like to highlight a national award. Um, I'd like to acknowledge that Baltimore County Public Schools was one of only five school systems across the nation to receive the, a Fuel Education Transformation Award for successfully integrating digital learning into effective instruction through our passport program. The Passport program launches conversational Spanish instruction at grade four to give students time and to graduate proficient in a second language. Passport has grown from 10 schools in 2014 to 45 schools, which is about 42% of our elementary schools this fall. So this month's star video, this month's video looks, takes a look back at our summer learning opportunities uh, for our students, including music, STEAM, our art camps, as well as the excitement of summer graduation and welcoming students back to school. So I'd like to launch our star video at this time. Hi, I'm Chloe. I'm a fourth grader from Newtown Elementary School. I'm enjoying my summer vacation by staying busy, and as you can see, I'm reading lots and lots of books. <laughs> well, enough about me. Let's see what other BCPS students and staff have been up to. Well, the first day we sight read a bunch of songs, and we narrowed down what we're going to play here. And it's a lot of fun because you just get to play music, different songs, just repeated, just to keep them going. Well, I wanted to do the STEM camp because I felt like it was going to help me boost on my learning abilities and my education as a student so far. The goal of the program is to look at the skills that the kids have been working on in their previous school year and help them to continue to work on, build, and then excel on those skills as they look to move into their next school year so that there isn't such a gap in the learning. We have students from all over the county. They're totally immersed in art all day long. I've been coming here since second grade and I'm going into 10th. So a good eight some years now. I just decided to keep coming here. It was great. I love the different teachers. I love what I was doing. And now I just built it up into this year. And there's a lot of freedom. There's a lot of different things we're doing. And I just fell in love with it. It's a feeling that I can't even describe because honestly no one really knows how hard it was, how close I came to giving up and just being here and being able to have the diploma in my hand is a feeling that I can't even describe. Once I had given her the news that I wasn't going to graduate on time, because at that point I wasn't even sure if I was graduating at all, I called her and she was like, 
she was like, you're my son and I love you, but I need you to do this. Like, I, I want you to be the first in the family really to graduate from high school. So that, it clicked. And then seeing everybody else around me support me made it so much easier for me to do what I did. Personally, it's my mother, you know. My mother's deceased, so it really got made me want to graduate even more. Made me push me, um, you know. Sorry for getting emotional, but that's really what made me want to finish. Good morning. Good morning, how are you? I'm ready for my first day at school. Someone raise their hand and tell me, why do they think that I would make you have at least two sharpened pencils? It's been a wonderful day. I feel so blessed to serve as the interim superintendent of Baltimore County Public Schools. Having all day today welcoming back 113,000 students. Our teachers were engaged in students in instruction, making sure that they were setting rules and routines very early on. And we could see all of the teachers getting to know every child's story. I'm just excited for the new school and so it's much, so much bigger. So we can have space and more learning and more tools for this great school that's very, very nice. I had my last first day of school. I'm actually happy and at the same time sad because I believe it behind my teachers, my friends, um, a lot of family members, the school community have grown and have learned to associate myself with. But also at the same time, I look forward to a great school year. Why? Because um, it's a year whereby legacies will be built and legacies will be left behind for younger ones to follow. I hope you have a great first week, Team BCPS. Sorry, Chloe, but we need your help in here. Well, I have to head back to class now. Have a great school year. <laughs> <laughs> and Mr. Chair, that's the superintendent's report. Well, that was a good ending. <laughs> Next on the agenda is an opportunity for uh, me to give a brief report. Uh, as we all know, uh, the Baltimore County Public Schools is back in action serving the needs of our 113,000 students. And with our new superintendent, uh, Verlita White, BCPS's core focus will be on equity and innovative learning. Uh, classroom focus will be, as you all have heard from Ms. White in the past, both literacy and behavior. And safe learning environment is, is the, one of the most important focuses that our system can have. Our system is the 25th largest in the United States. Uh, and it's, it's diverse both uh, ethnically and socioeconomically and in so many other ways. And importantly, it's also still growing. Um, our 9,000 teachers and additional 9,000 employees have one goal, and it's a goal embraced by our school board as well, and that goal is to provide quality education uh, to equip our students to be globally competitive, uh, be it college or career. I'm looking forward to a great school year, and I know my colleagues on the board are too. I'd like to end with just uh, another uh, notice that I got today that um, common sense the national nonprofit organization dedicated to helping kids and families thrive in a world of digital media and technology has recognized Baltimore County Public Schools as a common sense certified district. Um, the, the press release from Common Sense says BCPS deserves high praise for giving its students the foundational skills they need to compete and succeed in the 21st century workplace and participate ethically in society at large. Uh, the resources teach students, educators, and parents tangible skills related to internet safety, protecting online reputations and personal privacy, managing online relationships, and respecting creative copyright. I think it's a great uh, rec uh, recognition of our school system that as we uh, have a digitally delivered uh, curriculum, uh, that we also are recognized uh, for the way we handle that digital media. Uh, so that's my comments. Uh, next on our agenda is our student members' comments, and I ask Josie Schaefer to speak. Hi, everyone. Happy Tuesday, and welcome back to school. The week has gone by so fast, but I love seeing pictures of students enjoying their time in the classroom all over social media. The beginning of the school year is so important for students in all grade levels. This is a time to get to know your teachers and help them understand how you learn as an individual and in a group setting. 
The beginning of the school year is also a great way to get involved in clubs. There are so many clubs to choose from and it is also very easy to start your own. I recommend getting involved early with clubs and activities. It is such a great way to, to make friends and to stay active in your schools. Last Tuesday, I had the chance to visit a few schools with Ms. White and her staff. I was so excited to see a lot of my fellow board members also taking the time out of their schedules to visit the schools. It is so crucial for us to be active in the school system that we serve, and I hope that everyone will continue to visit schools as the year progresses. As it was my first day of school as well, I didn't get to visit every school Ms. White went to, but I was able to visit Arbutus Elementary School and Ridgely Middle School. I absolutely loved the spirit and energy our beautiful teachers and students had so early in the morning. And <laughs> I would like to thank our beautiful teachers that were standing outside who made sure I did not have to parallel park. Um, <laughs> I was, <laughs> it's a struggle. Um, I was also blown away by the warm and inviting energy both schools displayed. Ridgely Middle School definitely shattered the stereotypes of middle schools being scary. I quickly noticed the yellow line that normally divides middle school hallways in half wasn't present, and the administration team had big red buttons that said coach on them. That was a few of their little ways to create a friendly school climate, and that made a big difference. As students transitioned through classes, they, were, they would greet their administration team and were never afraid to ask questions, and their principal and assistant principals were always glad to help. I really enjoyed visiting these two schools, and I am looking forward to visiting more schools next month. Finally, as, a lighthouse school, as Lighthouse Schools begin distributing devices, I would like to thank BCPS for making sure that students have the ability to use their computers at home via the Sprint 1 million grant. This grant is available for Lighthouse students to sign up and receive a hotspot, allowing them to have web access outside of school. As more schools begin to implement work on the devices in and out of school, we don't want some of our students to fall behind because they don't have access to internet at home. I was happy to hear my assistant principals at Pike School discussing this option with students, and I hope that the announcement reached other Lighthouse high schools as well. The first week of school has clearly shown that our 113,000 students have a bright school year ahead, and I look forward to seeing everyone's accomplishments throughout the year. Thank you, Josie. All right, next on our agenda is item I. And that is consideration of the fiscal year 2019 state capital budget. And I call on Mr. Smith and Mr. Saris to present uh, the budget to us. And Mr. Dixit. as well please so mr. mr. chairman and members of the board we are asking your approval of the FY 19 state capital budget request if you will recall it was first introduced at the board meeting on August 8th and reintroduced at the August 22nd board work session we received several questions just yesterday and some this morning um, from board members related to the budget process about um, the budget process, middle school enrollment, and related projects, infrastructure, high school renovations. Um, Mr. Smith and his team will address the consistent themes of those questions. We have some detailed responses in writing for uh, all board members, which will also be posted online for the public as well. Again, this has been our promise toward greater transparency, and so we would like to fulfill that promise by offering the board those detailed uh, responses in writing and posting them online as well. Um, I'd also like to be clear on prioritization. I know that it has come up a few times, particularly this evening in um, public comment. So we need to be clear on how we um, prioritize our, our recommendations. Those recommendations are based on, number one, we have to look at the number of seats. Every child in Baltimore County Public School has the right to a seat. So, it, you know, they, we have the legal obligation to make sure that every, every student has a seat. So we have to prioritize based on the number of seats. We also have to prioritize based on the board's direction. To date, the board's direction has been um, air conditioning projects, central air conditioning projects to be specific. And so we need to take that into consideration as well as academic programming and other infrastructure needs. The capital budget before you tonight will resolve our seat issue at the elementary and middle school levels. It will also address our air conditioning needs and continuing projects that the board approved in prior years. 
With regard to high school seats, I've gone on record at the August 8th board meeting stating my plan to request planning dollars for anticipated high school seats as a result of the upcoming high school enrollment study. So that, um, and additionally, I just want to say that Baltimore County Public Schools and the County Executive's Office has been in communication and based on those discussions, I am hopeful that our needs will be addressed uh, system-wide. And with that, I'll turn it over to Mr. Smith um, for the remainder of the approval process and the presentation. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chairman, member of this board, um, as the superintendent has stated, we're asking for approval of the FY 2019 state capital request. Consistent with the superintendent's wishes, this process has been an open conversation with the board as well as various issues included in the state capital request. You may recall we received multiple questions from the board at the last meeting and responses were shared with you and posted on the website. The next step in the process requires submission of a detailed packet to the, st to the state internal in interagency committee on public school construction or the IAC by October 4th of 2017. The IAT the IEC decal package includes multiple forms that are required by the IEC in order to support our request. It will go through various stages of um, recommendations by the IEC and approvals by the Board of Public Works until the legislation adopts the final budget in May of 2018. We're requesting your approval for this request of the formal state submission. Um, there were questions that the superintendent men mentioned that we received yesterday and some today. We have prepared responses for those questions. Um, I'm going to share those in global uh, in very large um, areas in which they relate to. A lot of them were process driven um, priorities. Um, there were some about the high school seats that the high school um, um, planning for high school dollars as well as um, um, the um, northern um, northeast area middle school. I'm joined today by Mr. Pete Dixit and Mr. George Saris, which will help me as well to address any questions you may have. The process related to and, and all of the board members before this, we were able to get um, the questions in writing to you to today for this discussion, as well as we will post them um, on the website um, subsequent to this. The questions. Primary themes were based around the process. We've um, addressed this question and we're trying to refine it even more to align with your, your line of questioning. Um, our process is consistent and it has been consistent for many years related to how we receive um, ample input from the board, um, parents and communities, school, school communities, staff, um, the facilities department as well as um, research and accountability and assessment as well as our budget office as we compile all of the information in order to provide our process and planning for our priorities. Those priorities, which was stated earlier, has consisted of um, AC projects um, to, to include seats, uh, followed by seats and then infrastructure items that we prioritize. Those priorities are fluid because as projects are completed or are identified, they're added to the capital plan as we move forward. Um, next on that would be um, North, Northeast area, area Middle School. That project is a project that is on the capital plan. It is item number 17, I'm sorry, number um, 20. And that project was um, put on the board in order to address some of the targeted concerns that we have related to middle school enrollment. Um, this project here will certainly um, have a, a huge impact on the entire Northeast area to help overcrowding in a host of schools in that area, as well as looking at um, some of the physical facility issues that we have throughout that area as well. In addition to that, there's the um, uh, addition that is being added on to Pine Grove Middle School that will also help in in regional seats seats that are required for middle school level. Um, 
Next to that, we talk about our priorities. I've, I've listed them before. We, in the response that we have here, we tried to give greater de detail as it relates to how those priorities are selected um, and it's developed with, you know, this, with the state capital plan as we move through that process. That process, once again, is a fluid process. Um, what you have tonight <coughs> in the document, the one-page document, is a summation of all of the work that has taken place from all of the community input that we receive to from this board to this board, from school communities, from school administrations, from our uh, physical uh, funding agencies, state and local, um, to make sure that we can put together a capital plan that addresses our priorities. As the superintendent mentioned before, this particular capital plan will address our elementary and middle school seat requirements that we need in order to move forward. Certainly, as the comments were made earlier, we, uh, we will continue to work with our county partners to look at options as it relates to the high school level. We certainly are moving forward with the study for the high school seats and working with our um, uh, Dr. Brown in the accountability and research and assessment depart uh, department as well. In addition to that, I wanted to highlight you on some of our the high school renovations. Um, we have moved forward with uh, Woodlawn and with um, Patapsco. We currently have Lansdowne under um, development for an enhanced scope that we're doing, so that project is underway. We're hoping to have that information back in a few months uh, related to the fall and to move forward with that project. Um, there has been um, quite a bit of discussion related to um, Towson High School and Delaney High School related to um, planning dollars being placed on this capital plan. Um, certainly, as the superintendent said, that is a discussion that is ongoing with the superintendent and the county executive and their teams, and that, and it clearly, they, they have heard the message, and um, that issue is quickly being discussed as we move forward. The capital plan that you have before you today, once again, does not have that as it's listed now, but ultimately those discussions will continue to take place. With that being said, um, we would like to open the floor for any questions that the board may have at this time. Well, how about if we start with a motion to adopt the 2019 capital state budget? Moved. And a second? Second. All right, now that there's a motion and a second, we can have discussion. Mrs. Causey. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would like to make a motion that we amend the fiscal year 2019 state capital budget request by priority order that we add Delaney High School and Towson High School as items number 25 and 26 respectively for planning for replacement schools with the seats to be determined. The dollar amount would be zero until staff evaluates the budget needed to do a proper planning and design and requests it on the coming county capital budget request that will be presented to the board in December of 2017. The items currently numbered 26 to 34 would remain on the list, just two places lower. All right, there's a motion to amend. Is there a second? Second. All right, discussion on Mrs. Causey. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for allowing me to speak to my motion. Here at the board, we have heard uh, for my tenure, certainly, and even before my tenure on the board, two and some years now, about the issues of capital construction facilities. And in hearing those discussions year after year, and I do want to say also, I appreciate the work of the superintendent and the staff in responding to us. As I have said in emails, and I'll say it publicly, this is more information than the board has ever received um, from previous administrations. So I do appreciate your efforts to be more transparent and to be more informative uh, to the board. And it's with that information that I feel this is the time and this is the place to add Towson and Delaney. As uh, was pointed out in your responses, sometimes projects can take, high school projects can take six years. And in the information that you've given us about when the high schools will be at uh, maximum capacity coming is 2025. And fiscal year 2019 plus six is 2025. So we cannot delay making it known that these schools need to be put on the list as replacements. Also, in the priority order that was just recapped by um, our superintendent is priority on the number of seats and AC, educational programming, and other infrastructural needs. And Towson and Delaney both fall into those categories. 
Uh, Delaney with its high school MEP score, which is 1.48, puts it as the worst high school MEP that does not have a plan of how our students are going to be taken care of. And Towson, as we all know, is um, overcrowded now, only headed to be more so. Um, so by putting the planning and design money in now, it will allow the um, BCPS administration and staff to plan and design both high schools, utilizing economies of scale, considering logistical synergies, and it informs communities that these replacement schools are recognized as Board of Education and school system priorities due to Delaney's high school MEP score and Towson's high school's overall low building score and chief among other uh, documented deficits, lack of AC, inadequate space, overcrowding, and obsolete buildings. Our priority in planning and design of these high schools must be to provide the most safe, cost-effective, and timely construction process with the least disruption to the academic programs to meet our vision of providing safe and healthy 21st century learning environments to our students. So all of the information and responses just further confirms that this is the time that we need to do this. Other comments on the motion to amend, which is to add number 25, Towson High, and 26 as Delaney High, and then to push the others down the list. Mr. McDaniels and then Mrs. Hen. Um, I would certainly support the effort of um, moving toward Delaney and Towson, both having 21st century and safe um, schools for the students to learn. Um, I think both of those schools have demonstrated a high academic achievement, and we want to support those schools in every way possible. Um, the concern I have um, by specifically adding these two schools is that I don't think the board at this time could have uh, information about all our high schools that would indicate that those two in particular should be prioritized over maybe another school that exists out there. Um, and um, without some kind of objective way of comparing our high schools, um, I'm concerned about just picking those two. Although, again, I'm not uh, opposed to addressing the needs that might exist there. The other concern I have is we just recently looked at four school, four high schools that were um, under consideration for renovation, and we chose, for whatever reason, not to completely rebuild those schools. And I am not sure how Delaney and Towson would compare to the schools that we just chose to renovate. And in terms of fairness and equity, um, I just don't know why we, we would set out a plan specifically to rebuild those two schools when we just chose to renovate schools that some of which had uh, greater needs in terms of the building construction. So um, again, I'm not objecting to addressing needs at Delaney and um, Towson, but I think we have to objectively look at how we do that. Very good. Mrs. Head. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Ms. Causey's motion, which I wholeheartedly support, does not request dollars for, to start this process. It requests state approval for the planning process. Ms. White, I thank you for your um, commitment to supporting um, Delaney's and Towson's needs or whatever schools have priority needs through the county capital process. By requesting um, this approval in the state process, we are recognizing these schools' needs as a board. We've already recognized that. The facts are not in dispute. We have data to respond to Mr. McDaniel's comments. We have data on enrollment trends. We have data from the facility score that shows these needs. Again, the needs are not in dispute. It's what can we do as a board now to get the ball rolling for Delaney and Towson. Other questions or comments? Mrs. Miller. Yes, thank you. I, I also support the motion, um, and I appreciate Mr. McDaniel's comments, especially with regard to the need for prioritization. And I just want to re reiterate what we've heard many times from fellow board member Ms. Causey about the need for a strategic facilities master plan. Uh, and that is something that we need to be working on. But um, again, we're not asking for uh, money funding along with this request. And Delaney was on the schedule at the, la the last time. Uh, so it had already been selected by the system as a school that um, was prioritized. Other questions or comments? 
Well, I, I just said real quick that <clears throat> the allusion to the fact that we are interested in having a long-term study, or at least a <clears throat> more formalized study from this board on our capital facilities speaks to the notion that this is a process that involves many individuals and many partners, that involves the state, involves the county. In fact, because we have no taxing authority, it necessi necess necessarily, excuse me, um, requires us to, to have those partners involved. And so for us to, at this moment, be able to interject um, in such a substantial and significant way without having a more fulsome process as it relates to those specific funding concerns, I think can be problematic. I'd like to add that um, um, the process is one, and we've heard from <clears throat> Mr. Smith and Ms. White in the past, is a fluid one. Um, and we know that we need the funding authorities' uh, support to proceed with this process. And we've also just heard from Mrs. White and from Mr. Smith that there is continuing conversation with our local funding authority, uh, the county, regarding this matter. I think I would urge the board to uh, defeat the motion to amend, to vote in support of the 2019 capital budget as presented, and to continue to advocate to our county uh, to address the concerns that Mrs. Causey uh, uh, articulated. Um, we know that the process can and will be amended over the course of time between its October submission and the time that the legislature eventually votes on a capital budget in May 2018 and the opportunity for us to advocate and effectively advocate. And I can tell you, I look around the room and there's some pretty darn good advocates here um, uh, that uh, are making progress and I think that uh, we need to get our funding authorities on board with these decisions uh, before we um, tweak and, and perhaps harm our entire state capital budget presentation. Um, Mr. Hayden. Uh, I, I sense a, <clears throat> a reluctance uh, for the board to state a position that benefits the children of Baltimore County. <clears throat> and I think that's what we're all about. We are to present on behalf of the children of Baltimore County a plan that we feel will best benefit the future of education in Baltimore County. If we don't do that, we're making a huge mistake. Um, sort of been there, done that in a, another time in my education career. And, and it comes back to haunt you. You have to go to the table with things that make sense. And the fact that political entities don't agree with you, you have to go ahead, take a position, and then work on convincing them that that's the position that makes sense for the children of Baltimore County. And that's what we're all about. That's our responsibility. And the fact that somebody says, well, the county executive won't do this or won't do that. Um, again, the county executive listens to citizens in Baltimore County. Uh, when I was a member of this board many years ago, um, we regularly uh, went to the mat with the county executive about issues where we disagreed. And that was something that made sense for Baltimore County in that we were getting ideas and issues out there rather than saying, let's put our arms around each other and walk out smiling. We wanted to come to something that everybody had worked through, everybody agreed on, even after a struggle to say, this is where we're going to go. The county executive, as the funding authority in, in the final instance, uh, does have the ability to say yay or nay. But then again, the county executive does listen, believe it or not, I know something about that one too, uh, does listen to what people say. Uh, so the more people you can have standing up and saying, this is the right thing to do for the boys and girls of Baltimore County, the more successful we'll be rather than standing back and saying, let's just, let's be nice now and maybe next year. We can't wait for next year. I, I quite frankly, in my new tenure as a board member, as opposed to my former tenure as a board member, I'm, I'm shocked by the condition of our school buildings in Baltimore County, just utterly shocked. Uh, there are buildings in this county that uh, would not have looked like this when I was here before. And, and uh, the fact that we haven't made more progress is just really uh, disappointing. Um, 
Mr. Young. I understand um, Mr. McDaniel's point about, you know, right now not knowing where, what schools. What we have to remember is, yes, we're here to, to make the decision. What we also have to remember is there is a Board of Public Works that does not have a problem with holding funding from us, particularly when their issue is on AC. And right now, as we look at this capital plan, there is no plan for AC for Delaney High School. You know, as we look at this, we see that Towson High School is well over capacity. At some point, we're not going to be able to solve that by putting trailers there. What we have to do is make a decision that says, okay, we're going to start somewhere. It may not be the best place, but we have to show that to the state that we have a plan in place, that we're looking out for the best interest of our children, and that if necessary, as we get more data, we will modify it. But we have to start somewhere. All right, others. Ms. Schaefer, you haven't had a chance to speak. Thank you. Uh, while I may not have the ethos on this situation, I am a student whose school recently got renovated. Uh, Pikesville High School had a limited renovation. And in my perspective, I think it heightened student morale. I think it inspired more students to come to class. And I think with Towson and Delaney, while they are at the center focus of our county, they're in the centermost area, I think students do deserve that chance where their building is crumbling or like lands down, they're sinking uh, with a limited renovation that could do wonders on student egos, uh, how they perform in school. Because if you're sitting in a building like this, where it's like nice, white, clean walls, and there's technology available, and the school isn't falling apart, it's different. Um, I think that it affects your performance in testing or in schools. But um, as a student from Pikesville, I think learning in the trailers was very different than learning in a new building. And I think you can see that as you learn in a school like Towson right now as its state. Um, this is just food for, food for thought. But I think that um, while it is important to give these schools a chance, I'm unsure of the haste that we may have on putting these schools on the list. But I think it's important for the schools to have the opportunity for that. Mrs. Miller and then Mr. McDaniels. Um, the way that we advocate best for these schools is to make the request. And we want to make that request from a position of strength, not weakness. I, it doesn't make any sense to say we shouldn't make a request for funding to the state. We should sit back and advocate some more. We've done a lot of advocating already. We got to make a request. And as Mr. Young pointed out, they'll either accept it or they won't, but they certainly won't give us the money if we don't make the request. Uh, I think that's all I have to say on that. Mr. Point. McDaniels and then Mr. Yulefeld. Thank you. Uh, I, I wanted to uh, support very much what Mr. Hayden said about putting forth uh, issues that best support the students of Baltimore County, whatever that may be. Um, I also think we have to do it in a way where that's fair and equitable. And the same board within the last six months just approved not a replacement, but a renovation for schools that were, uh, according to the objective data, some in worse shape than Delaney. And I don't know how, again, we could come back just a few months later and recommend to the funding authorities that we replace two schools when we had schools just a couple months ago that we uh, approved a renovation. It just doesn't seem equitable around uh, in serving all the county. Mr. Yulefelder. Um, I agree with everyone. Um, <laughs> now, let me clarify that. Um, I, I agree uh, with what Mr. McDaniels just said. However, I, I think that the process um, is such that uh, by, by including this on the list, I think all we're showing is the good faith of the board. Um, and you have to remember that the state funding is a very small part of the total overall funding uh, of any capital project here in the county. Uh, so I think just from a standpoint that I'll support this only because I want to show the good faith. But I certainly agree with Mr. McDaniels that, that we can't slap these other schools in the face by saying that uh, we chose to delay 
a renovation on, on several schools, uh, wait to a time when we can push for, for new school buildings. Um, there are many, as I look down this list, we have many schools that are overcrowded, and perhaps some elementary and some middle schools that are more overcrowded than Towson. So if you want to use overcrowd as your criteria for building a, a, a new Towson, I think you've got to go a long way to look at the other schools. I only support this to show good faith. That is the only way I would support it. Certainly, if it had dollars attached to it, I would not support it at all. All right, there's a motion to amend on the floor. Um, Ms. Schaefer, I'll remind you, you don't vote on these matters. Uh, all, in favor, <laughs> all in favor of the motion to amend to add uh, number 25 and 26, Towson and Delaney. Without dollars without dollars please raise your hand one two three four five six seven the motion carries all right now we have an amended motion uh, to accept the um, uh, 2019 state capital budget any further discussion mrs. Miller I actually have a couple of questions and I want to thank you for all of the questions you've already answered and, and making those accessible to the public on the website um, so my first question is how and when will BCPS be addressing the schools that have partial AC? My understanding, now this is the forgotten population in BCPS, they're not on any list, and from information that Dr. Dance provided us either early this year or last year, um, there are about as many classrooms in those schools that are non-air conditioned as there are classrooms left in the totally non-air conditioned schools. Does that make sense? <laughs> so this is a, a you know, significant number of classrooms and a significant number of students who are not being addressed. So if you could just speak to that. Well, first I'll start off as saying the capital plan is a fluent document and as was stated, by the previous superintendent um, as we continue to work through the items on the capital plan that was brought forward tonight and any additions that were made we will continue to monitor and assess and work on a plan to address those unfortunately all of the priorities can't be on the plan because the dollar amount would be so voluminous that it would be impossible to have anything done so it's not that we're not addressing them it's just we have to go through the priority orders of, of what we would define thus far so we uh, we've identified them we've shared that with with the board it's made available on the website and we will continue to work with our funding agencies both state and local to address those at the appropriate time when the other priorities are further along in the process thank you for that I had one other question yes ma'am um, you had mentioned the submissions that you'll be sending to the Board of Public Works and the IAC. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, will the board be receiving copies of those submissions? Um, it is, once we compile the document, we provide a copy of that. Well, we, we provide a link. And while I say that, it's, it's the size of a, an oversized phone book. So we've got to find some mechanism for the board to be able to to peruse that without it being as cumbersome as this team puts it together. So um, after this process, there is a considerable amount of work to make sure that we um, provide the documentation to IAC, which there is a lot of documentation required, and certainly this board um, through the superintendent will be made available. Thank you. Mr. Stewart. So I think Mr. Yulfelder made a persuasive point as it relates to um, the vote we just took, but you also mentioned how this could affect projects including partial air conditioning. Um, when and to, to what extent would you have an understanding of how the kind of changes being made here tonight would affect that going forward? Um, next. I'll start if you. Sure, go ahead. No, I'll yield to the superintendent, then I'll start. Just caveat that with the acknowledgement that there's no funding <coughs> associated with what we voted on. Well, as was previously stated by the superintendent in the conversations with the county executive and their team, um, as was shared at the August, uh, the August 8th meeting, that planning dollars for consideration would, would, was, was part of the discussion to add on the county capital plan, mm -hmm. which the state dollars, the state does not pay for any planning dollars. So putting a planning amount up there, the state's not going to fund that anyway. So ultimately, it would be the county's obligation anyway. 
that was the discussion there. As it relates to what those projects look like and the, the associated costs, that's something that the superintendent and the CE and, the, and their various teams will have to work out how, how that can be included or <coughs> what can be included. So um, it's still undetermined as of yet what that will look like. However, the, with this de decision that was made tonight, it allows that process to have the planning dollars there. But having it on the state plan, I don't want to mislead anyone. It does not mean that the state is going to fund any planning dollars. Even though it's going to be zero on it now, the state does not fund planning dollars. Further comments? All right, uh, there's an amend. Mrs. Miller. Um, I will be offering an amendment as well, but I did wanted to make some comments about the priorities. Um, and I do appreciate that you've pr provided a little more information on how priorities are selected. Um, but the overall process, we've, we've been through 20 questions to try to get to this. Uh, it looks from the outside to be very confusing to not really have um, common sense to our prioritization on our request. Um, it may very well be commonsensical, but the public and the board really cannot see that. It would be very helpful to have more definition to how these um, priorities are made. A formula would be really nice, but I know it can't always come down to a mathematical formula. But something like, okay, when a building is X number of years old, it's on the list, we will prioritize them based on the MEP score, the building score, you know. I mean, it could be explained in a way that would be understandable to the public. Without that, it looks very unfair. It looks very haphazard. And I think it would alleviate a lot of angst in the public if we had more information on that and some sort of <coughs> internal document that explained the process and how it's, the selections are made and then a list of priorities that include everything, whether it's a lot of money we're talking about or not, but something that projects wouldn't just drop off from year to year unless the need was met. So I just wanted to make that comment about the prioritization. Um, I, I'll just make a comment yes. on that. Um, our team um, will provide any detail related to whatever priorities. The catch is the priorities that go on this, someone has to make reality. So if the priorities can't, if they change at a moment's notice, we have a whole lot of people back here that have to make that change. So that's why I don't want you to think that priorities just come out of the sky. We work really hard in helping you develop your priorities and then get them into some articulated document. So I don't want that misconception that we don't, we don't provide priorities. It's just if the board's priorities change, that's more than just a change on a piece of paper. That is a host of agencies, departments, schools, communities that have to adjust and could impact other priorities. So, that's, so just bear in mind that we're, we're not trying to be nefarious in keeping things away from you, but as this board makes, and any other board makes decisions about changing priorities, they have other impacts on other things that we do. And this team, followed by a lot of men and women behind us, has, has to put that into some tangible mechanism for the superintendent to communicate. So I, I just needed to share that. So it's not a rebut to what you're saying. I just wanted to make sure that you understood that as priorities change, these teams, the superintendent's teams, have to make those priorities go in alignment with projects that are already underway. We have AG projects that are underway. Mm -hmm. We have replacement schools that are underway. We have renovations that are underway. We have uh, roofing and chillers and boilers that are underway. If those priorities change, it, it could potentially impact those projects if the funding from the state and the local does not increase. 
So that's why it is a much complicated process, and we try to provide as much documentation as we can, but we still have to be, we still have to be true to our capital plan process. Understood. Right. I, I thank you for I, that. And I, I think I, that I think that uh, I thought we were ready to vote on the amended capital budget, but I think I heard Mrs. Miller say she wanted to make another motion. If you have a motion, please make it. Yes. Um, I passed out earlier uh, a handout here regarding uh, Lansdowne High School. And I have to apologize for my voice. I am a victim of that first week of school round of illnesses. Mm -hmm. As long as you stay on that side of the table, <laughs> you're okay with that. I move to amend the FY19 state capital budget request by removing the request for funding for a limited renovation of Lansdowne High School and instead requesting planning funding for a replacement school. So this request would include the funding for a replacement school for Lansdowne High School. Um, so to speak to Hold that. Oh, we need to see if there's a second to that motion. Sorry. Is there a second? Second. All right, now that there's a second. Thank you. To Miller. speak to that motion, um, a limited renovation for Lansdowne High School is, an, is inadequate to the needs of that school. And we have been, that has been demonstrated to us um, over several years, I would say. Uh, we have heard through emails and testimony from literally hundreds in the Lansdowne community. Um, we've, most of us, except for the newest members, perhaps have seen the pictures of the building at Lansdowne. Asbestos tiles, um, uh, an auditorium that floods every time it rains, um, elevation shifts within a room, within a floor, meaning the foundation is so compromised that we met, we could actually measure it with a ruler, um, the elevation change. The Lansdowne community, I believe, gave up in some respect because of a lack of support from their elected officials and appointed officials. Some of those in the community felt defeated and they settled for the promise of a top-notch renovation that would match the outcome of Pikesville High School. That was what was promised. Now, um, Ms. Causey and I actually approached Dr. Dance um, prior to our vote on the contract for the Lansdowne renovation in March and we asked him, what does that mean? What is a Lansdowne quality renovation? Does that mean similarity in the funding? Or is it similarity in the outcome? Because Lansdowne has substantially more need than Pikesville had at the time. And it was explained that it was a similarity in outcome. In order to get Lansdowne to have a similar outcome, it would take more money because they have more need. So I, I did put together an analysis here. Lansdowne has, is a bigger school. There's more square footage. It's over 200,000 square feet, where Pikesville was at 159. And the enrollment is substantially larger at 1420, where Pikesville was 837 at the time of the renovation. The actual renovation cost for Pikesville was $49 million. Now what's being projected for Lansdowne is in the neighborhood of 46 million. So it's, it's less for a bigger school. And when you divide out what is the actual cost per square foot, Lan Pikesville was at $308 per square foot where the projections for Lansdowne would put it at only 230 per square foot. So that is not a similar outcome. It's not even similar in funding. It doesn't get them there. 
There's a motion. Now, a second. if Lansdowne were to be funded at the same level, at 308 per square foot, the cost for the renovation would be $62 million. That's a pretty pricey renovation. And that would only make them similar in funding. It still wouldn't get them there as far as a similar outcome because Lansdowne has additional needs. So we're talking a $70 million <coughs> renovation or more for Lansdowne. When we get to that point, what we really need is a new school. We all know it. We've all seen it. We've toured this building. Uh, so there's quite a deficit in the funding that's being proposed in this request. Um, what we don't, we have an obligation to be responsible to our taxpayers. To pour that kind of money into an inadequate renovation is not responsible. And what we don't want to have happen is to dump a lot of money into an inadequate renovation and then have to come back 10 years from now to fix the sinking <coughs> foundation and all the other structural problems. Um, changing this request from a renovation to a new building doesn't delay getting an adequate building for Lansdowne. And the reason it doesn't is that in six years you can have a new building where if we accepted the renovation, an inadequate renovation, that would put them years down the road later for whatever their further needs would be. Now we've just approved a commitment at least to Delaney and Towson. Lansdowne is, has the lowest building score of all high schools in the county. I've not seen a building worse. Let's make a commitment to Lansdowne that will actually do the job. Let's not waste taxpayer money. Let's answer the call for this community. All right, are there other comments on the motion to amend? Mr. Stewart. You know, I'll start by just saying I appreciate your concern for Lansdowne High School and for the students and the parents and the community members that I see every single day, the district in which my family and my kids are districted for. I believe that this would be the gravest mistake this board could make at this moment in time. I think it is a momentous moment in time for this board. I cannot stress that enough. I, I think that if we do not rise and answer the demand, the need of this community to have a school that works and a school that will set a new standard for what all renovations can and should be in this county would be a grave mistake. We have heard about the terrific things that are happening with the renovation. We, we, we rejected the renovation that was before us, members of this board. We went back and we said we needed more. We needed what this community needs. And so our team, our, our many-member team has gone back, has worked in partnership to provide a, a type of renovation that is going to make us proud, it's going to make the county proud, it's going to make the community proud. It is to make this recommendation is not only to torpedo the substantial renovation, it is to ensure that we get bumped in a significant way as a community behind other schools that are maybe growing more quickly and that demographically support different outcomes. This, is, this might be a finger in the eye of certain people, but this is not what we need right now. And no, we're not talking about five years or six years. We might be talking about 10, 15, 20. This is a significant period in time. And it cannot be that your only data points are some of the most, or one or two or three or four opinions out there. We have to look out for the community as a whole. We have been, I know that many of you have walked through that community and walked through that school. It, it is time to provide them with a substantive uh, renovation, a renovation we can all be proud of. Other comments? Ms. Causey. Thank you, Mr. Gillis. I would just like to say that I support Ann's motion um, for exactly the same reasons why I made the motion for Delaney and for Towson. Um, I believe that having toured Lansdowne on multiple occasions, um, <coughs> that it's flawed architecture 
with all of the level changes that they have, they are a non-ADA compliant school. And even with the renovation, it is still going to be incredibly complicated and hard for anyone that has any type of mobility impairment to travel from one end of that school to another end of that school. And I, and I don't make this lightly, and I do know that the funding is a huge issue and that the timeline is a huge issue. But being a parent of students that already lived through a renovation in place just recently, I can tell you the timeline was supposed to be less than three years and it ended up being four. Part of it was because one of the contractors cut through a sewer line or something and the, all of a sudden the uh, auditorium fills up with uh, septic fumes during back to school night and then you know they have to do these uh, additional repairs. The, uh, and, I, and I appreciate your, your perspective about the timing and the need and I believe that um, Lansdowne High School does need a quality solution equitable with other in the county and, and I support that motion. Um, you know, the, the, the point about Pikesville and the amount of money that they got is relevant not only to the number of students but also with what they started with. The structure that they started with was a sound structure, good bones if you will. Um, having walked through Lansdowne and other schools in the county, it's, it's just not, um, it, it's, an obsolete, it's an obsolete building. So I would support her motion and I would ask others to support it. I know the funding is a big issue, but we've heard from two of our elected officials tonight and we've heard multiple times from other elected officials that they are committed to getting the funding and they are committed to helping this school system so that every child can have a safe and healthy learning environment. Mr. Stewart. So <clears throat> as we continue to consider this issue, um, we know that, again, there are good things in the works. We know this kind of renovation is a renovation that produces a school that has the look and feel of a new school. This is real money. This is the real deal. But I also encourage this board that if we want to revisit this issue once things have been released in the fall, we can do that. And once we have more things in front of us, we can do that. Let's not do it tonight. It is not prudent, folks. Other comments? Um, I'd echo Mr. Hayden's comments that it's this board's responsibility and duty to ask for what our students need. I've been to Lansdowne personally for all of the reasons Mr. Stewart mentioned. I support this motion. Lansdowne needs a new school. I ask for your support of this motion. All right, Mr. Yulefelder. Um, we listen to engineers and architects and, and to use the comment that the school was sinking. Uh, that's your comment. Uh, I don't believe it's the sentiment of the board. It certainly isn't mine. When I listen to professional architects and engineers tell me that they can take whatever problems exist and assure us that they will not exist in the future, uh, I, I think that means a lot. So uh, all the comments that you make relative to the school uh, re really don't hold weight with me because I listen to the architects and engineers who are professionals. And let me tell you a little bit about Pikesville that you people don't know. There was a large portion of Pikesville uh, that was never finished from 1965. Now, I don't think very many people know that. It was boarded up with some plywood uh, over the years. And, and so in order to finish off uh, that, there was an additional cost involved. Um, Pikesville was a two-story building. I don't believe Lansdowne presently is. I'm not sure. I've walked through part of it, but I don't know if it's a two-story building. So you can't compare apples and oranges when you're dealing with older um, facilities uh, where uh, renovation uh, can be more for one and not for the other. So a square foot cost to me uh, doesn't make a lot of sense. And also, let's remember that we've asked, we asked that there be an additional look at the scope of what we're doing and it's my understanding uh, that the um, county executive is well aware of it and, and appears to be ready to fund the additional scope over and above what's already been allocated so to 62 if it takes 62 million i'm confident that the county executive will put that up then the other thing may be an irony in the future uh, to build a new school um, is anywhere, I'm told, from high school, 130 to 150 million dollars. And just a few minutes ago, we're talking about building Delaney and Towson. Well, 
if we only got X amount of dollars, are we going to allocate it to Delaney, Towson, or Lansdowne? Where's the money going to come from? Where, where's the funding source? That's all. I, 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 I would not support uh, Ann's uh, so, amended motion. Good. Thank you, Mr. Yulfeder. Mrs. Miller, you've had quite a yeah. bit of time on this motion already. Talk, um, talk. Uh, if you're brief, speak again, please. Well, it is my motion, so I think um, to have a full conversation is important. Um, I, I appreciate that you want to see what, you know, from the experts, what the problems are with the building. Well, we have a lot of information from the experts about that building. We have information from the um, 2014 facilities report. We have information from the state FY14 maintenance report. Um, from the Board of Public Works, there was, there's, you can find um, from their transcription, there's information on the, the issues with uh, Lansdowne High. The executive summary of the um, February 16th feasibility report. Here are some of the issues that were noted by the GWWO architects hired by BCPS water damage, the ADA issue, issues, topography changes, worn finishes, structural settlement, high traffic area, level changes, no air conditioning, poor circulation, asbestos, and there's more. Um, this is one of the worst buildings in the county. And if we... And that's why it'll be the best renovation. Well, we can say that, but it looks like empty promises okay. to me okay, wrap because up your comments so we can I, I will when, when I've made the point. Um, we promised them a Pikesville quality renovation, but this request does not reflect that. Pikesville was three hundred and eight dollars per square foot. This reflects two hundred and thirty per, per square foot for a bigger building with substantially more students and substantially more problems. So we can say, oh, the county executive will do what's necessary, but the board is being asked to approve something that is not adequate for the problems at this school. Mrs. They Causey. need a new building. Mrs. Causey. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to just uh, address um, a point by my colleague, Mr. Ufelder, who talked about the engineers. We did receive um, at a um, board meeting where we received the scope of the project for Lansdowne High School, and we got the opportunity to uh, have questions for the engineers and the architects. And apparently in Lansdowne, one of the things that was uh, revealed in those conversations is previously they had engineers try to stabilize the foundation. And yet those, those efforts failed. And once again, new engineers are going to try a new method to stabilize the foundation. So it's not a guarantee because work was already done by a reputable organization that was hired by this organization, and yet it failed. Uh, so that's point number one. And I'll try and be brief, Mr. Chair. Uh, the second is that repeatedly we've heard that this is a fluid document. It's a fluid process, that things change. Um, so the fact that it's set there does not mean that we cannot improve the outcomes for this community and to say that what we really need is a new paradigm of using our money more wisely for the long term. New construction costs less than renovation construction. That's another point. Um, the other thing I would say is that we heard tonight as we have heard many times about these contracts where Mr. Ufelder asked, why do we need a contingency fee on this contract? Why do we need that? We see it constantly. In fact, we see it on every contractor contract, okay? For every construction, the video, you know, concrete work, what have you. When you open the wall, you don't know what's behind that wall. The field conditions are still there and many times it's unknown. And that's what we have at Lansdowne, just like we had at the school my children attended. You open up the walls and things change and that increases the cost and it increases the time. Thank you. All right, we have a motion to amend uh, by Mrs. Miller to uh, uh, items seven and eight, the limited renovation of Lansdowne High to make it, to remove those and to uh, ask for a new structure. 
All those in favor of that motion, please raise your hand. The motion fails for lack of a majority. Now we have the amended motion that includes Towson and Delaney uh, uh, to vote on the 2019 state capital budget as amended. Uh, any other discussion? All in favor, please raise your hand. Mrs. Causey. Thank you. I just wanted to make some points that um, although there are other issues on this state capital budget that I feel need improvement, um, that I'm hoping that the statement that this is a fluid process is true and that we can continue to work with the superintendent and with the staff and with our funding partners to continue to make improvements for these schools um, and these communities. Very good. Now, all in favor, please raise your hand. The motion carries. All right, next on our agenda is item J. Mr. Smith, Mr. Saris, Mr. Dixit, thank you. Um, item J is personnel matters, and I invite Dr. Mayo to come forward. Good evening, Chairman Gillis, Superintendent White, members of the board. I would like board consent for the following personnel matters, retirements, resignations and leaves of absence. So I have a motion to, to approve the personnel matters as presented in exhibits J1 through 3. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 The motion carries. Thank you, Dr. Mayo. Uh, next is new business administrative appointments. For that, I call Ms. White. Chairman Gillis, members of the board, I'd like to bring forward to you for your approval the following administrative appointments. Assistant Principal, Dundalk Elementary School. Assistant Principal, Joppa View Elementary School. Assistant Principal, Sparks Elementary School. Coordinator of School Counseling and of in the Office of School Counseling. Director of ESOL and World Languages, Department of Academics, and Specialist for the of Office of Equity and Cultural Proficiency. Do I have a motion to approve the administrative appointments as summarized by Mrs. White and presented in Exhibit K? So moved. Second? Second. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Mrs. White, it's yours again. Okay, it is my pleasure to introduce the following uh, board appointments uh, for promotion, and I would ask individuals to please stand along with their families to be recognized. First, we have Meredith Alvarez, who will be the new assistant principal at Sparks Elementary School. In keeping with tradition, Meredith, do you have anyone here with you this evening? No, they're all at sports. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations. I'd also like to introduce David Davis, Assistant Principal, Joppa View Elementary School. <laughs> have with you here tonight. Congratulations. <laughs> I'd also like to introduce Jennifer Hernandez, the Director of ESOL and World Languages, Department of Academics. <laughs> Jennifer, do you have anyone here with you this evening? Stand up. And your new professional family. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> I'd also like to introduce Melanie Martin, the new Coordinator for School Counseling in the Office of School Counseling. Melanie, who do you have here with you tonight? Yeah. Okay, very good, very good. Congratulations. I'd also like to introduce Tracy Zimmerman, Assistant Principal, Dundalk Elementary School. Yeah. Do you have anyone here with you this evening? Congratulations. Oh, hi, Mom. Hi, Mom. <laughs> Congratulations. And um, Margie Berrios Brown, who is not here tonight, she is going to be our new specialist in the Office of Equity and Cultural Proficiency. And Dr. Brown, would you like to wave on her behalf? <laughs> Congratulations to her as well. And Mr. Chair, that ends our appointments. Very good. Well, congratulations to all of you. Uh, next on our agenda is ac uh, new business action taken in closed session, and we invite Mr. Nussbaum to come forward. Everyone walks out of the room when I sit down. <laughs> Every 
Don't take it personally. You're a magnet. <laughs> Um, earlier this evening, the board considered seven appeals regarding confidential employee and student matters in your quasi-judicial capacity. Uh. All, all, all seven of these matters were uh, considered on the record because no requests were made for oral arguments. At this time, it would be appropriate to confirm the actions uh, taken in those matters in closed session in those cases, which were hearing examiner numbers 1731, 17-40, 17-44, 17-48, 17-49, 17-50, and 17-53. Do I have a motion to approve the uh, items that Mr. Nussbaum has just listed uh, to confirm action taken in closed session? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor, please raise your hands. Motion carries. Thank you very much. All right, next on our agenda is contract awards, and for that, I call on Mr. Stewart. Thank you. Members of the board, uh, the board's voting contract committee met earlier this evening. We have items M1 through 7, which are being forwarded to the full board for approval. All right. I know that Mr. Young said that he wants to have one item uh, segregated. Which one is that, Mr. Young? Number four. Number four, so uh, I'll ask for a motion to approve M1 through three and M5 through seven. So moved. All right, no need, no second is needed. Any discussion? All, oh, Mr. Hayden. Just a question on, do we have um, guidelines as to how many bidders re we require before we accept bids specific? I saw several of the bids where we ended up having a number of people requesting bid papers, but only two, uh, in one case only one responding? That's one is adequate as long as it meets our minimum uh, requirements. If it doesn't, then we reissue the entire proposal. And we've done that as a practice? Yes. Very good. All right. All in favor of the motion, which is M1 through 3 and M five through seven, please say aye. 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 Those contracts. Mr. Chairman, I'm abstaining from number two. All right, abstaining from number two. And Mr. Young, you wanted to segregate M4. Yes. And do you want to talk to it or you just want to abstain from it? What? Abstain from it. Okay. So all in favor of M4, uh, knowing that Mr. <laughs> Mr. Uh, Young has abstained, please say aye. 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 That motion also <laughs> carries. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you, Mr. Saris. Thank you, Mr. Dixie. Can I just make a quick note? Please. I think with item two, Ms. Causey had uh, abstained on the vote. That's correct. Is the record clear with respect to the vote at the board level? She wasn't present. In the room when the vote came. That's fine. There you go. Thank you. All right. We're down to item N on our agenda, and that is board member comments. I'll start with Mr. Hayden. We should start from the other end. Okay. Of let's. <laughs> Well, I try to switch it up, but I'll Which start. you haven't done it as long as I've been here. Was it two meetings? Chair. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Mr. Young. You don't get we'll mad. <laughs> we'll get even. Mr. Young. Thank you, Mr. Gillis. Gee, thanks, Mr. Hayden. Um, just really briefly, um, it was... A unique experience the first day of school being with you know miss white and her leadership team and seeing the you know excitement of some of the students and how some of them um, performed for the cameras um, but also how some of the teachers in there you know really did um, set the ground rules for the year so um, nice unique new experience thank you very good mrs head thank you mr chair um, so tonight we heard from mem many members of the community during public input about <coughs> concerns regarding transportation. And quite frankly, I've been perplexed as to why there have been so many issues with transportation at the start of the school year. We have the most amazing, dedicated, and hardworking staff in that department that I've ever witnessed in my professional career. We've got amazing team, we've got new technology, we've got folks who know how to get students safely to school, and yet we still hear of instances where that's not happening. And I'm scratching my head wondering why, and knowing that as a board, we need to look into this. So I'm looking forward to further conversations with 
um, you, my colleagues, to understand what we can do to improve communication um, between the Office of Transportation, between our schools, between our parents. How can we make sure that we're delivering consistent and accurate messaging um, from anything such as start times to policies to rule enforcement? How can we work together as a team? So each of those groups have their own responsibilities and roles with making sure our students get to school on time um, safely. That's the beginning of our student day and the end of their day. How do we want to, you know, how do we want them to start their day and end their day? Um, it should be in a positive fashion. And I believe we're doing this largely, but there's still room for improvement. We need to deliver transportation service reliably as expected. Um, when there are issues, we need to address them promptly. We need to make sure that this is a service we're delivering efficiently so that our students are on the bus for as short a time as possible. Um, this is not a learning experience. They need to be in the schoolhouse and we need to maximize learning time. We need to be responsive when there are issues. There are going to be issues. When you're transporting 70,000 students, there's no doubt there are going to be issues. It's how we respond to them that should be the measure of our success. And lastly, we need to be flexible in our policies and in our rules, and we need to support working parents. This is the number one of concern I've heard from working parents, is the fear that their students, when left alone, particularly middle and high schoolers, are not being transported to school safely and reliably. It's difficult for them to find alternate transportation when we don't come through. Um, so I'm hoping that the issues that we've heard these past week and a half have been bumps in the road with the beginning of the school year, no pun intended, and that we are off to a smoother start with transportation. We've got all the ingredients for success, and I look forward to making it happen. Mrs. Miller. Thank you. Um, first, I guess just to get it off my chest, I'm very disappointed by the outcome for Lansdowne High. Um, it's our responsibility at this point now to make sure that we did not make an empty promise, that we will deliver a Pikesville level outcome for Lansdowne High, whatever that takes. Um, second, uh, I don't think, it, I'm not sure if it was mentioned already, but the board will be holding a public input hearing on discipline and school violence issues on October 10th as part of our regular board meeting. And uh, I ask interested citizens to review the current discipline policies, which I believe are 5550 and 5560. Um, earlier in the year, when the board was initially um, reviewing those policies, uh, I put together a focus group of parents, teachers, and advocates from around the county to make recommended amendments to the policy committee. I'd be happy to share those recommendations with anyone interested in them. Um, amending our discipline policies is only a first step to addressing a very complex issue, uh, but it's a critical first step. So I encourage the public to submit input both by email and to, to the board and by testifying at the hearing on October 10th. And finally, I want to uh, thank Ms. White for the um, meetings she had with each board member. We, it was a lot of luncheons for her. Uh, but I thought it was uh, incredibly productive, very straightforward. Um, very open, and uh, I was very appreciative of that. Um, Ms. White has expressed a number of items that she is committing to to improve our system. And so verbalizing those things, that's the first step. I look forward now to seeing uh, those actions being followed up with that. So thank you. Mr. McDaniels. Thank you. Uh, I would just want to echo what my colleagues have said about the first day of school. It was tremendously uplifting to see the activities of our uh, teachers, our, our wonderful students, and um, I even want to compliment the parents and community that are so passionate about uh, education in Baltimore County. I want to spend, uh, send out a special shout out with Mr. Birch and I to Woodbridge, Woodbridge. Elementary School, which we were <laughs> well entertained there. And uh, again, the kids were just so wonderful to see on that first day of school. And although we have so much to be happy and thankful about in BCPS, we know that we have challenges, as my colleagues have said, with transportation, facilities, student achievement, 
and, uh, and the climate issues that we bring up. And if we don't think we have challenges, we aren't really doing our job. It doesn't mean that we can't work together as a team to address these things. And I think it's a tremendous opportunity for us to work together to improve those areas that the, the public and our community are pointing out, the parents are pointing out to us. But uh, again, I think if we work together, we can get to a better place by the end of the year. Thank you. Mr. Birch. Good shout out, Chuck. Good shout out. <laughs> um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it was a, a busy first day and a busy second day. And on the second day, uh, I was able to stop in at our Kenwood High School, uh, where I was a uh, high school student uh, just a few years ago, uh, Seneca Elementary School, and also stopped in at Chesapeake, and also at our Perry Hall Middle School. Um, we've, had a, we've had a lot of discussion this evening about a host of matters at our schools, and we've highlighted overcrowding. But we must remember that there are other schools, schools that were not mentioned this evening, schools such as uh, Oakley and our Pleasant Plains Elementary School, Summit Park. The numbers are just off the charts at Summit Park. They put to shame the numbers of other schools mentioned this evening. But that's not what our focus should be. It should be on working collectively to solve for these challenges. By any measure, the citizens of this county who have uniformly voted for the uh, bond referenda to finance the bulk of the cost of school construction and other repairs. It is, not, it is an astonishing level of commitment by our citizens and through the leadership of our county executive and others. These are historic levels of funding. They don't fix everything overnight, but these really are dramatic times for improvements to our physical plant, to, our, to, our, to the infrastructure of our schools for the benefit of our students. And that ultimately benefits our entire quality of life. Uh, the uh, Perry Hall Boundary Study uh, started, that's for the new Northeast Elementary School. That started uh, the week that school started, and there's another meeting next week. And Chapel View Elementary has, a, has an event uh, next week as well. And for uh, my colleagues who will be joining me on the Policy Review Committee, we will be meeting next week. See you there, <laughs> which is really here. Thank you. Ms. Schaefer. Okay, one quick thing Get I would like. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would like to thank our members from the Baltimore County Student Councils for spending their school night here. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry if you have homework, uh, so we have, <laughs> I, I did mine. Oh, uh, you're gonna stand up when I say your name. So we have Rob and Olivia, who are educational liaisons, and they're super cool, and we also have Noreen, who is our public affairs director, and I'm so glad that we have the student voice present in our board meetings, and I look forward to our first executive board meeting tomorrow at six at Building A. Hey. <laughs> Thank you, Jersey. Mr. Yulefelder. Thank you. Um, in my travels, I always look for interesting things relative to Baltimore County, and I have a document here called Public Education in Maryland. Um, the General Assembly uh, desire to make a comprehensive study of the public school system, the state of Maryland, and uh, they appropriated $5,000 to carry out this study. Uh, this was the act of 1914. So I want to just read a couple of lines uh, relative uh, to Baltimore County. And you have to remember this is 1914. Baltimore County, with a relatively superior school system and good physical conditions, leads the white schools of the state with an average daily attendance. St. Mary's brings up the rear. Even if the white schools of these two counties were of equal efficiency, Baltimore County gives its children a better education. Uh, it's an old document, and I know Verita loves old documents, so I'm giving it to you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> it's great reading. I'll put it in the archives. It really well. is good reading. Thank you. Mrs. Causey. Thank you. Um, I want to say thank you. I want to say thank you to all administrators, facilities, personnel, and all the 12 month employees and teachers who helped over the summer to get ready for the start of this school year. Among many activities over the summer, several teachers did complete the Orton Gillingham training, which is a program to help struggling readers, including students with dyslexia. The board approved that new contract for this training in the spring, and um, thank you to the decoding dyslexic advocates who um, brought a lot of information forward um, to the board. 
hopefully the success of these trained teachers will allow us to um, to bring that program to others so that we can really, um, as our interim superintendent, Ms. White, wants to do, is to really increase literacy. So that can be very important. Um, also, before school started, it was inspirational to attend the new teacher orientation. Uh, I want to say thank you to all those energetic, intelligent, hardworking, and caring individuals who are called to this noble and vital profession. Our students' lives are enriched by these people, and our communities thrive when we have students graduate college and career ready, willing and able to contribute to our diverse and democratic society. It was also exciting to visit all six schools on the first day tour with Interim Superintendent White and other BCPS leaders. Um, it was great to see support for our public education from all aspects of the communities and community leaders. I was especially grateful to see Governor Larry Hogan there and State Superintendent Dr. Karen Salmon, who joined us in visiting Baltimore County Elementary Schools. Also, the county executive, state delegates, senators, and other community leaders joined in that exciting day. Additionally, I appreciate the uh, interim superintendent including me on visits to four additional schools on Thursday. Um, also, before school started, I was able to attend the state fair, and it was fun and informative. Uh, like Mr. Ufelder, I like to pick things up when I travel that are interesting. And among many of the interesting agricultural um, uh, stands that they had going on, there was one by the University of Maryland uh, that has an Institute of Applied Agriculture, which is a 60-credit certificate program located at University of Maryland College Park where over 90% of their students find work in their field of study by graduation. So it's really interesting to learn more about agriculture, how important it is, and also how it can be a really great um, occupation or career for our students to consider. Um, and just to echo some of the other uh, concerns brought up by board members and by our public comment tonight, um, in the area of transportation, I'd really like to see additional communication uh, to the board about the issues that we're having, also to set up um, more clear communication paths for parents to reach uh, staff in times of concern, but also to um, try and figure things out ahead of time. We also have the issue with this, the split schedules of students where our working families uh, need help. Um, these need to be addressed immediately as student safety is paramount, and we need to realize the very real dynamics of working parents and family situations where many, many students do not return to the same location each day after school. This may be an issue where the board evaluates outdated policy and understand from the interim superintendent how she may reevaluate the procedures system-wide so that our principals have the guidelines to support families while keeping our students safe. Um, upcoming, we have um, operating budget discussions. Um, as we also talked about tonight, there is the county capital budget that's upcoming. Um, so it'll be hard work to prioritize and balance the many needs of this very large and diverse system where we do have programs from toddlers to high school students that are taking college courses. Um, I look forward to working with um, Ms. White and teachers, administrators, our advisory councils in evaluating the many programs, the school facility needs, including the immense costs and logistics of our former superintendent's ongoing STAT initiative. Uh, there's a lot of work that needs to be done, and I look forward to us working together to do that. Um, one aspect of STAT is the constant student exposure to the digital world. Just recently, BCPS was recognized for our digital citizenship, and I wanted to take this opportunity to thank board member Ann Miller. Her work since arrival to the board on student data privacy and safety and technology has been incredible. Her tenacity in this area of reflecting parent and community concerns and researching these issues is commendable. This led board members to be included in the safety and technology committee meetings that has increased the board's and BCPS administration focus and improvements in this area. And I look forward to that continuing, so thank you for that, and thank you. So while there are these and other challenges to work on this school year, I am dedicated to collaborating with all to strive for improved academic opportunities and achievements for all our students. I personally have two recent graduates from BCPS, and I have one current BCPS student, so I know firsthand the concerns of parents. I also know the wonderful educational success that is possible when our educators are this dedicated and when they are supported by the system, by the board, by our administrators and by the community. So I encourage parents, teachers, administrators, 
and our professional uh, associations and community members to get involved and to also reach out to the board and administration with your input. Thank you very much. I'm really looking forward to the school year. Mrs. Eaton. Thank you. I had two comments that I wanted to talk about, but Ms. Hen and Ms. Causey covered them quite well. <laughs> the first one was the um, bus issues, and we have all heard them from our stakeholders. But I do want to say that um, throughout the years, Baltimore County Public Schools have won many awards for different things, and that I hope that one day soon that BCPS can win an award and high praises for providing the best transportation for their students. The second issue was dyslexia. And I want our school to continue to focus on um, dyslexic students, especially, um, see, I like to go first, because time comes around here, I forget my thought. <laughs> um, diagnosing them early, like in kindergarten or first grade, and continuing educating our teachers on how to diagnose dyslexic students. Thank you. Mr. Stewart. Uh, shout out Woodbridge, of course. <laughs> Start with that. Um, I'll just say I appreciate the discussion tonight, but I, I do reject the notion that this board hesitates when it comes to doing the right thing for kids. We've decided when to take stands, and we've decided when to try to sit down and find compromise. And in this push and pull, we have a tremendous staff who put in tremendous hours to deliver for students who who really work uh, incredibly behind the scenes, um, not just in these board meetings to get things done. But at the end of the day, we're, that's what we're here for, to deliver for our students, right? We're not simply advocates and we're not simply thought leaders or promise makers. We have to be decision makers too, who find ways to work with our communities to make real a promise about good schools and good education. It's a weighty duty. It's an important one. Uh, but I really enjoy carrying it out with all of you. Mr. Hayden, you're last. For what reason did you make me last tonight? <laughs> Next time you'll be last. <laughs> this, uh, uh, when I worked for Peter Angelos down with the Orioles, uh, we always talked about season, season and whatever. So equating the school year to seasons, this actually is starting my 14th season in the school board business. Uh, and not many of them here, obviously, with the current board, but previously. And the thing that hit me and continues to hit me as I go through that the magic of that first day when you look at the young people coming into the school, looking for the opportunity that only we can provide through a good education is there. So it holds the challenge out for us to do the best job we can and to disagree and argue about things when we disagree on them to get to the best solution we can get that benefits, uh, and as I said maybe 10,000 times in my previous board experience, the kids are the bottom line and we can never forget that. Thank you. All right, our next board meeting is September 26. We're adjourned.